like the stages in cancer. So it's actually in a way easier that way because now we can roll into talking to a physician which we should be doing anyway. We should be, you know, talking to the physician because we're treating an inflammatory disease in the dental office. So we should be working hand in hand with their physicians as to why do they have this inflammation and how can we correct that? Because it's all tied to their medical, you know, are they a diabetic? Are they, you know, any of those kinds of things. That's all tied together. And that's why they also have these manifestations in their mouth. So it all ties together really well. We're really the first responders to see what's going on in the mouth is a good indicator that something might be going on in the body, maybe before they even find out they have diabetes. But because we see inflammation, we see bleeding in the mouth, and then they investigate it further. So it's, it's an exciting time to be a hygienist with that. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to a bonus episode of A Tale of Two Hygienist podcast. My name is Andrew. And my name is Michelle. So for those new to the podcast, each week, Michelle and I bring on an amazing guest from the dental world who fills our nerd brains with new insight or affirms our clinical abilities. And we are so grateful for the time and effort these guests put into making us better. We also wanted to acknowledge that this episode is powered by Crest Oral-B. And this episode wouldn't be possible without them. And we know you guys are going to really enjoy this episode. Get ready for your unofficial Dental Hygiene Podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast guy genist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Thank you so much for being here again, though, and coming this early in the morning. It's okay. <laughs> And you're, you had your winter coat on and cut from Montana and it's not even that cold here. No, it's not. It's very warm actually this morning. Now, if you ask me the temperature, I would not call this warm at all. Oh, it is. I like to pretend that I can part. Like, this is, this is really warm. This is no problem. But then I'm like freezing on the inside and like, oh, yeah. I can't handle this. That is the one thing that Andrew and I do have in common is like the moment we walk into any like building or hotel room we immediately turn the heat on oh my gosh like I'm up high like 78 80 in the, oh, hotel room. Mm-hmm. the first time i ever went over to one of his like rooms and i was like let's go and i was like it's actually it's actually warm in here <laughs> it's oh i i could have tolerated i this. can trust your judgment now for okay. everything else andrew because oh, exactly. your temperature exactly is thermostat's <laughs> regulated. okay so we're here at the Greater New York meeting. You're speaking. Mm-hmm. And so thank you for taking the time to come and chat with us about the topic that you're going to be presenting on. So tell us a little bit about what that topic is. I mean, it's a general topic. It's, you know, just for the oral health of it. So it's tools and protocols. And what's the latest in periodontal disease? What's the latest in peri-implant mm-hmm. disease? But kind of centering around home care protocols as well. And then the new classifications examination, how do you examine, you know, the teeth and how do you examine the implant before you, and how do you, how do you make notes of that for the classification? So let's get into it then. What is um, some of the new stuff you're going to be talking about? Well, the new AP classification that just came out in 2018 now, that's kind of needs to be clarified for a lot of hygienists because they need to know, well, what do they do with this? You know, what are they recording their patient notes and how does that apply to them? What is the clinical applications for these, these classifications? So I tried to go through those and make that more generalized so that they know what to write in their, their progress notes. Got it. Got it. So what I think you and I had a really good understanding of it when we were at Euro Perio, but now when I read it, it's not as easy for me. Have you read it since I, Euro Perio? I mean, I've seen, well, yeah, I was up in uh, AAP and uh, yeah. discussed it again. Yeah. It's funny because every time I hear like an expert speak on it, I feel the same way again. I'm like, like oh, oh, okay, I can get thank this. you for clarifying. But then when I'm left to my own devices, I kind of get it all jumbled up and confused again. So yeah, uh, yeah, I feel the same way. Yeah. So what? Let's. You want to roll into your sure? I can. Yeah. I can um, 
uh, talk about that a little bit, you know, and just kind of start kind of an overview. Mm -hmm. Um, The periodontal disease classification was, you know, developed for more of a medical interdisciplinary model, very similar to like the stages in cancer, Mm -hmm. you know, cancer stages. If you've had anyone that's had that, you know, in your family or you know, near to you, you know, all about the stages of cancer and things. And it's very similar to that. So it's actually in a way easier that way, because now we can roll into talking to a physician, which we should be doing anyway. We should be, you know, talking to the physician because we're treating an inflammatory disease in the dental office. So we should be working hand in hand with their physicians as to why do they have this inflammation and how can we correct that? Because it's all tied to their medical, you know, are they a diabetic? Are they, you know, any of those kinds of things? That's all tied together. And that's why they also have these manifestations in their mouth. So it all ties together really well. I like that, um, how you put that. I always like these little snippets from people that come on the, like we're treating an inflammatory disease just in the dental office. We have ways to put, you know, dental care because it's not just cleaning teeth. No, way beyond that now. Now that we know and our focus is biofilm, it's an interdisciplinary focus because if we combat and we eliminate the biofilm in the mouth, then they're going to be less likely to develop the oral systemic diseases in the body. So it's, it's, we're kind of, it kind of elevates hygienists. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really exciting time to be a hygienist because it elevates us and we're really the first responders to see what's going on in the mouth is a good indicator that something might be going on in the body, maybe before they even find out they have diabetes, Mm -hmm. but because we see inflammation, we see bleeding in the mouth and then they investigate it further. So it's, it's an exciting time to be a hygienist with that. So actually this ties it together really nicely. I think this new new classification. classification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. I really do think so because it breaks it down and you, you, for instance, for natural teeth, you evaluate it, Mm -hmm. you know, you find out if there's any inflammation in the mouth, Mm -hmm. you know, any pocketing, any kind of things like that. Find out if it's, if it is inflamed, is it biofilm induced or is it inflamed from another reason? You know, did they cheek bite? Did they do a trauma on their, from their occlusion? Did they they have something else going on. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to figure that out. So there's three different areas in the tissue that way. And then once you find out that, you know, you've done your full mouth exam and you've looked at the perio pocketing and and you look at the films and you induce, okay, it's some form of periodontal disease. Okay. And then they break it down three ways after that, then kind of, was it systemic disease induced, you know, Mm -hmm. was it something that they had in their medical history? So you need to look at your medical history and you need to look at that and you just need to make notes of all that. You need to kind of just go step by step with that. So the first step would be to assess it, you know, look at all the tissues, take some interal camera shots. If there's any inflammatory Mm -hmm. spots, that would all be in the record. Then you kind of break it down into it. Is it healthy? Is it in? Is there inflammation? So healthy or inflammation? Mm -hmm. Okay, it has inflammation. Now let's look at the radiographs. Is there any bone loss that goes with that? If there's bone loss that goes with the inflammation, we're now looking at periodontal disease. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we've all done. And we just look at, is it localized or generalized? Mm -hmm. So now we've, we've narrowed it down to it's okay, periodontal disease. It's localized in one area let's say, you know, and we look at that and we generalize, we write that down. Is it yeah. both? Okay. And if I can remember correctly, when we were talking and calling it gingivitis before it progressed, we had to have, was it 10 bleeding sites? That has to be over 30% okay. in 30% the mouth. Of bleeding, bleeding sites. Of bleeding so points, this yeah. is why documenting bleeding on probing is going to be yeah, very you know, important. We go through that in that in the Liz Graham programs that I do, we actually walk the hygienist through, well, what would you do mm. for this gingivitis appointment? Well, you first have to do a really good full mouth probing mm-hmm. and kind of go back to the basics is in a way we're going to take the, the whole first quadrant mm-hmm. on the facial side. You're going to look at the pocketing, but then you're also really going to concentrate on where the bleeding points are. Yeah. Mark them. Yeah. Because it doesn't stay in a lot of people. So you have to do it 
you know, the, the facial of one a quadrant, time. a section yeah. at a time, and then go to the next quadrant right. and then go to the lingual and so forth. So it, it takes longer mm-hmm. to do, I would say, kind of an inflammatory full mouth probing that you need to make. Now, let's say it's, you count the number of teeth, it's over 30% bleeding points. It's, it's it qualifies as gingivitis. And you get them back for a gingivitis appointment. And at the gingivitis appointment, then evaluate, you look at just concentrate, you pull up your roadmap mm-hmm. on your computer. You're charting. You're charting yeah. is your roadmap mm-hmm. and you've got all your bleeding points. So now you just concentrate on where those bleeding points are. You, if you've got a, um, you know, an ultrasonic, you're going to, you know, use that a little bit longer in each one of those bleeding sites. And you're going to really make sure that you've got all that inflammatory disease with the ultrasonic. If you ideally have a subgingival air polisher, that's where you would use it on all these bleeding points and really target them, you know, and then a real percentage of your appointment is going to be home care. So that's what I'm going to be talking about here at the Greater New York is home care. Preach it. <laughs> yeah. But not, not so much, no, not so much anymore are we doing the brush and floss, but we're saying to the patient, hey, you have an inflammatory areas mm-hmm. in your body and where the biofilm is, is located. And this is going to, looking at your medical history, Mrs. Smith, you know, you, you have some markers where you could develop diabetes in your family and everything. Mm If we need to get a handle on this inflammation now so that maybe you won't develop this oral systemic disease because Mm -hmm. that's linked to this. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of giving them the why. Why Why are we so concerned about these bleeding points and why are we asking you to do this specific home care. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And there's some specific home cares now that are recommended for yeah. gingivitis. Mm-hmm. You know, you have, you want to do a really good job of using probably electric toothbrush now, which is a ACP guidelines as well, electric toothbrush to get rid of the biofilms, or you want to use a water pick to get rid of the biofilm. You want to do both would be, I you know, be wonderful and get rid of any biofilm anywhere in the mouth. Mm-hmm. So with uh, Oral-B has developed the the app that they can follow with their electric toothbrush. And it isn't just a marketing thing. It's a thing that shows them that they've gotten every bit of mm. biofilm off in their mouth at least once daily. And that for preventing an oral systemic disease in their body, mm. it's a whole different way to look at it. Not like, I think you should just brush and floss. Mm-hmm. I think you should just brush and floss. Right. That, really? That motivational you know? interview. But you, you want to you tell them why, why is mm-hmm. this, what's in it for them? You know, why are they, why are we specifically recommending that? Right. You know, so it's a whole different twist on it. We're not so much having to just say, I think this is the way you should brush your teeth. <laughs> you know, it's, this is the way you should eliminate the biofilm in your mouth every 24 hours and you need to brush, you know, floss or use a water flosser and it rinse every day, mm-hmm. you know, twice a day. And if right. every 12 hours you do this, you're less likely to develop, you know, oral systemic disease. Well, that's a huge difference. Right. Yeah, for sure. We definitely have changed our home care recommendations. When you, when you take this stuff in, it's just like nothing. Right there. <laughs> well, Andrew's into the restorative end. Of I know. <laughs> I mean, it's not that I don't know. I mean, I love all this stuff too. I mean, it's, it's, I was just thinking that, you know, we have a new hygienist in our office mm. and I think this is, when you're specifically talking about going back to the basics sometimes, I feel like all hygienists have probably been out for a, even a few months, mm-hmm. three, four, five months. Like now that you're out of school mode, get back into a decent course and get back to your basics for a minute and realize how important it is. I, I honestly think that's what made teaching has made me a better clinician because I do have to go back to the basics all the time with them and go, why do I do it like that? Like, how do I get that piece of calculus off? How do I talk to a patient that I need to motivate? And so I'm very grateful for that because it, you do, you have to, you have to like get back down to your foundation, but you get into the clock in clock out monotony of our profession sometimes. Well, you know, we got so much technology now. Think about it. I mean, we, when we first started out as a hygienist, we were using mainly, you know, your probe and your scalers and, you know, we didn't have all this technology. We didn't have the interrail camera. 
We didn't have the sleep apnea checklist. We Mm -hmm. didn't have the, you know, smile design thing that they're doing Mm -hmm. with the mouth. We didn't, we weren't working on all these different things still within our same amount of time. Yeah. So we had more time then. Yeah. It's more time to think about it, more time to, to, to go into that areas. And now we're so technology driven and we're so, um, you know, we've got a computer that we're handling and we're doing all these things on the computer and it, it, it mm-hmm. takes you away. It kind of makes you move away from that. And now because of biofilm, we focus, we need to move back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We need to move back into that and we need to spend a, a, at least some portion yes. of that time that you have with the patient mm-hmm. because the biofilm elimination is really the key. Now we know that at home, at home, that's, I think that's where so, we get lost. We exactly. lose the message. It's not just what we're doing in the chair, but it's all about, I mean, te- the, the teach the man the fish, right? Like that's just the quintessential example of our profession. We got to teach them how to maintain. So yeah. if they go from now, let's say they're not gingivitis, like how okay. they we've, we know that we have bone loss, which is what you're saying right. is. So now we would progress into the, you know, three forms that they've outlined for periodontal disease, Mm -hmm. you know, and the one that we're kind of centering on now that's been more confusing is the generally localized and generalized periodontal disease, you know, which is what we deal with a lot. Yeah. Hygienist. And so how do we look at that and how do we stage it and how do we grade it? You know, so we have to stage and grade it. So um, one of the concepts I picked up at the last AAP, which I thought was was great, was let's just divide it in half for right now. Think about it. Is it a stage one or a a stage two or is it a three and a four? So first of all, just separate that. Okay. Now, stage one is your four millimeter pocket or less. Your stage two is your five millimeter pocket that's bleeding. Okay. Okay. Stage three is your six millimeter pocket with frications and bone loss. That's where you would be recommending regenerative periodontal disease treatment. Mm -hmm. So one and two is what we would really be treating in most general offices. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then we would be referring out three and four. Okay. So try to separate that right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Is it five millimeter pockets that are bleeding? You know, is it or less? Is it a one and two Mm -hmm. or is it a three and four? So just kind of... Right, right away, swash that off. Because the three and four are pretty obvious. They'd be more obvious. Right. Yeah. The one to two is a little bit more. There's nuances between those yes. that are a little yes. harder to identify, but yeah. at least you could half it. You can half it. Yeah. Okay. You know, and, and then the frications and the bone loss, six millimeters or deeper, we now know we need to do almost a guided bone regenerative treatment for mm-hmm. regenerative periodontal disease treatment after six millimeters because mm-hmm. we need bone there. Okay. You know, so just swap that apart and then know that you've got that. So now you've got it staged. Let's say it's a stage two, because this is where a lot of, this is where you're going to be um, moving them into a scaling and root planing appointment, mm. either stage one or stage two, they can do scaling and root planing, but primarily stage two, that's your main scaling and root planing appointment. Okay. So let's just say they're a stage two. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, so we've got them as five millimeter pockets that are bleeding either localized or generalized, mm-hmm. and we're going to send them back, you know, get them back for the one to three teeth or the quadrant of replaining and scaling. Mm-hmm. So they've got that. So now grading. So then we, we have to grade it. And grading is based a lot on the risk factors. You know, um, you, if you really zero in, and I had to read all those 19 references to, to kind of qualify this and figure it out. But the the main thing I kind of focused in on is the, Smokers or non-smokers, you know, because smoking, it really makes a huge difference. So that's where I really qualified, changed it. And one, one of the speakers at the AAP said something kind of profound. He goes, because we asked more questions about this. And he said, well, you grade them a B. Almost everyone will be a B and they have to earn an A or they digress to a C. Uh And I thought that's brilliant because it's really true Mm -hmm. because if they were ever a smoker, that kind of throws them into right. the e, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of our periodontal disease patients are smokers or are currently smoking like mm-hmm. one to 10 cigarettes a day. And then the ones that were smoking more are in your C mm-hmm. category, a higher risk because we're trying to grade it according to how we're going to 
manage it? How often are we going to see them back? And how are we going to manage it for that patient? So what I like is that the, the stages are the current state of their disease orally. And then the grading is more looking at the person, their lifestyle, their systemic concerns, because I think that was, has been a struggle for a lot of people in the dental profession because we focused, had blinders on for just the oral issues. And now we really are taking in the systemic concerns and the lifestyle choices. Yes. I think that's really, I think the future. Yeah. So that's kind of, that's kind of separates it. So they would be considered a B in most cases then. And because, because most of the grading system is based on five years and so it's hard to do that, like right out of the shoot. You've just saw the patient. You've just saw him for the first time. Mm-hmm. How are you going to grade them when it's based on a progression right. up to five years? So that was, to me, that was the confusing part. How are you going to do that? Mm-hmm. You know, and, but with, with no big, no risk factors, you know, no big medical mm-hmm. flags, no smoking, that kind of thing they more qualify for grade A. Yeah. When you're treating this patient, you're not going to have to also be looking at, you know, maybe you should see your physician um, because you have diabetes in your family, right. or heart disease mm-hmm. in your family or those kind of things. So, or, you know, and so then when you take that now, you've got them staged and you've got them graded and then you just follow them. Each maintenance appointment, then you would work on, on grading them. So they would still be a periodontal disease patient where they were, but you would grade them differently. Because that, that can ebb and flow. Yes. But not so much <clears throat> the stage. No, because they, you know, where this, well, the stage would change too. Okay. Because you, uh, you know, obviously might bring them into a stage one periodontal disease okay. in a maintenance area because you've, you've treated them. Got it. Scaled and replaced them. Got it. So that could change, but it's, it's still going to stay in the one and two. Got it. So you've kind of, you know, separated them. Are they a one, two, or are they a three, four? You're sending them to the specialist. So that, I think that helps a lot of hygienists get through that periodontal disease part. And let's hope that they're referring out. (laughs) Yeah. So that's, you know, that's, that's where we really need to separate it. Okay. Then if you take it into the implant area, that's the part that was kind of vague and things. And so to do more reading and more Mm -hmm. research on the implant area and, you know, the implant area is divided into your, your peri-implant health, you know, so you've got to assess the implant, right? You know, you've got to see where, what is the health of the implant, you know, and how do you do that and that kind of thing. And is it a mucositis? Is there any inflammation? Mucositis is gingivitis for implants. You take it into that. Or is there actually peri-implant disease right. going on where there's actually more bone loss? And that's a little trickier part for people to figure out sometimes. And so that just goes back to Mm -hmm. evaluating it. And then they've added another category now with soft and hard tissue efficiencies. And so I think where people get confused on that, that one I was actually dealing with and had in my book already. So that part I wanted to explain when I did that clinical applications for the perio mm-hmm. perio implant advisory column. Mm-hmm. You know, how are we going to do the clinical applications right. for this implant area? So mostly it's, you know, think of it as how do you want to follow the patient, you know, for their conditions and what do you need to write in your progress notes? You know, how do you need, and this also needs to go and follow them onto their insurance forms as well for mucositis or gingivitis as well. So anything that you put in your progress notes Mm -hmm. then should be given to your administrative people as well to use in their insurance areas. Right. So what I think is interesting about the implant codes is that one, we actually have one for health or not codes, classifications Yeah, that we have one for health for implants, right? which was not really one that we've ever had. And I like that the peri-implantitis is now biofilm um, induced. Right. Whereas once upon a time, it was all encompassing of any bone loss. And that was ridge deficiency. That was trauma. It was whatever. What it could have been very large for the reason for bone loss around an implant. But now it's siloed as biofilm induced, which would be peri-implantitis. And then this hard and soft tissue right. deficiency that you talked about. I look back, and like, how was that not ever classified? I know. But we didn't have it. it was I know. At the time. Yeah, for sure. Which yeah. is one of the reasons that, you know, at Europeo that they're talking about 
the new classification system being so adaptive to mm, new and point. emerging technology. Like we can right. add new things that we don't even know that we need to know now. Exactly. Later on, we can plug it in. Given room to evolve. Which yeah. I thought was... Well, really and cool encompasses thing. all hard and soft tissue mm-hmm. deficiencies. And yes, exactly. Yeah. And then I know that they just did a... Because what you brought up the insurance part of it. And I think the... The sad part with us not diagnosing properly for most of dentistry, like the history of dentistry, is that we haven't been able to get data. So we really don't actually know who, how many people are diseased, like because we've been calling them D1110 for profi for a very long time. So we can't, we haven't really gotten accurate data. And so when we look at insurance, that gap is going to be, especially medical, to bridge that gap. It's going to be a little harder because they're going to be like, but all your people are healthy. <laughs> like, you know, what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, it just, the, I'm really happy. Codes versus yeah. And I think yeah. that we're going to start to see more implant codes. Cause I know there's a, yes, a group there's more coming think, out yeah, mm-hmm. for dental implants, because right now you, there's not even a code for maintaining a healthy implant. I know it's, I know. and it's, it, that's been really hard for people. They always ask, you know, and what, you know, yeah, there's only there's actually only a code at the present moment because they're still just putting those new codes through mm-hmm. that actually for taking off your full fixed yes. arch prosthesis. 6082, 6081. Yeah, but it, like yeah. Mm-hmm. 6081. And it's like, that's really bizarre because that's the only one that we yes. have. It, it, that's yeah. Right. And there's so Placing many implants for four yeah. decades, five decades. What like, you know, now? 50% of the patients you see with an implant are going to be a single molar implant. Yeah. So how does that apply to those patients or to that office to be able to do with this implant? It's not Not at all. all. Not at all. You know? So yeah, I'm so glad that they're working on that and, and getting that qualified and, and that kind of thing too. So, you know, but they, but the implant one, I think the main key with that is that we need to figure out what we need to, you know, assess the implant, you know, and we've got our assessments, you know, I've, I've been talking about this assessment, you know, that we've outlined in a textbook and things for years, you know, that we need to visual tissue assessment, which now qualifies into whether there's any soft tissue deficiencies and things. Is there any, you know, do they have nice keratinized tissue around the implant? So that falls into that category, Mm -hmm. you know, so we've got to assess that right off the bat. We've got to do it. If there is inflammation, use your gingival index. You know, is it a one? Is it, is it mild? Is it moderate? Or is it severe? A one, two, or three? And write that in your progress notes, gingival index, inflammation of one, two, or three, and outline that and have that be one of your main things. Then you're going to, you're not going to probe for six months after the implant's been restored. So that's important to know. And probing around implants for some people, it's kind of controversial still and, and things, but really the main thing that people should remember with the probing is that it doesn't really tell us the health of the implant. And, you know, you can look at it for bleeding points and things like that, but they don't even really show up very much around an implant patient. So really for probing, which I was really excited to see this classification come out on this area, was to outline baselines. Mm-hmm. baseline probings at one year yeah. after rest, after it's been occluding on. Right. So one year after, you know, you're biting on the implant, that's where you want to take your baseline probe reading. Yeah. Now you actually, the bone matures at one year. Yeah. So at one year, now the bone level is yeah. mature. The crestal bone level is, is there and you can actually get an accurate probe reading. So at the probe reading at one year, then then thereafter, when you pick up a probe mm-hmm. and you should probe around an implant thereafter each time you see them, if you see a difference in your probe reading, right. you know something's going on. But it's bone loss. It's not tissue loss. So it's some, for that concept, sometimes hard, I think, for people to... Yeah. Uh, and I, I would like everyone just to join in my hashtag of probe the damn implants because yes. the controversy has got to stop. Like it, it does. Just, now, I, what I think they're doing this dichotomy, don't do, but it's a do, but a do with a different technique. 
like you have to be smart about how you probe dental implants and it's lighter pressure and it, your angulation is different. And it's, a, it's not just like go in there and like you would a natural tooth, but you still need to do it. I think that's yeah. where the controversy just stops, like do or don't. And no one takes it to that next level of you should just do it differently. Well, I understand what the, what the physicians are or what the surgeons are dealing with. Regeneration, you need six months yeah. after the regenerative treatment, whether it be the implant placed or whether it be a tissue graft, whether it be a, any type of rest mm-hmm. uh, regeneration, it's always a simple six month rule yeah. where you don't interrupt or you don't interfere with the regeneration process that's going on. So that's where they were always like, I'm not sure if we want to say to pro, because we don't know if they're going to do it too fast, too early, too hard. Yeah. But once you're past that one year after the implant's been restored, we're on a solid baseline course and there shouldn't be anything that you're interfering with in that regenerative process. You should be there. It should be osseo integrated and it's there. So then there shouldn't be in this issue anymore. And so even if you waited one year Mm -hmm. after the implant's been restored and then you started probing, you can feel very comfortable that you're not interfering with any of the regenerative process. Mm -hmm. And I think that I think is what a lot of hygienists want to feel comfortable about or understand. I agree. To kind of just wrap up the peri implant part of the classification, you know, what do you have to have in your notes? You know, how do you do it? You assess the implant. So now you've got the assessment, you know, and with implants, the only difference is that you can have a 0.5 to a 1.5 millimeter of bone loss at one year. And that's considered okay, let's say, you know, post-loading, kind of post-loading yeah. average where the crestal bone level has settled, remodeled, is that remodeled what they or yeah. crestal bone levels remodeled. And so when they did the classifications, they even put it as less than two millimeters is what the new classification states. So it's still considered a peri-implant healthy if the bone loss is less than two millimeters. So just so you know, the new classification things. So with the understanding that it's never going to it's not going to continue to regenerate. No. And it's so at one year, the bone level should be where it's going to be. So that should not change. If it changes and it, it increases to over, you know, two millimeters into the three to over three millimeters Mm -hmm. of bone loss, then, you know, something's going on. So, you know, you, you know that there's bone loss. So you do measure it right at one year. And it might be zero bone loss at mm-hmm. one year. And that's that patient's custom reading. And so for before the classifications, the perimucositis was known bo- no bone loss, you know, less than two millimeters and, you know, inflammation present. Mm-hmm. That's mucositis. And then you get into peri-implantitis, which is anything over the two millimeters of bone loss and inflammation. And if you haven't, the, the, final column that they just added in this classification was that you have, what do you do with a patient that's uh, never seen before? It's a previous, has implants, but when they come to you, it's been, they've had this implant for over five years, but they don't have any x-rays. They don't have anything with them. So that's the final column. And if they fall into that column, if it's over three millimeters of bone loss, Mm -hmm. they're in the peri-implantitis category. So that that's only difference with those. So you just make those notes with your, you know, do your thorough exam and then make those notes. But the biggest thing I think I want you to walk away with is to take a full mouth probe reading at one year Mm -hmm. after the implant's been restored and a PA or, you know, vertical bite wing or a, a radiograph, whether it be a CBCT, Mm -hmm. whether it be at one year, after the implant's been restored. Mm -hmm. Now that's your baseline radiograph. It should follow you for the life of the implant. Yeah. So that radiograph, whatever it will be, would be compared to every other, each year you take another radiograph to monitor the implant and look at the original baseline radiograph. Mm -hmm. So that's how I take away how you evaluate the soft and the hard tissue. So do the probe reading, So that's a concrete Mm -hmm. clinical application. You just make sure you have that baseline radiograph and that baseline probe reading. If you don't have one, you never saw the patient, Mm -hmm. then that day, here's your baseline probe reading and here's your baseline radiograph. And we're going to go from there. Right. With implants though, is there a recommendation of, 
okay, we've had this much bone loss or this much destruction. Now we need to refer back to, at what point do you refer back to the specialists? After three millimeters of bone, anything like higher right, than like three right millimeters. Yes, because it can progress faster than periodontal disease. So you don't want to watch it. You, if you see that they're actually losing bone around that implant, mm-hmm. you need to investigate why. And right. you need to do it as, as quickly as you can. And in most cases at that point, it's really good to get a 3D radiograph and, and find out what's going on and make sure that that's not, you know, what kind of residue is around there, you know, get that cleaned off or whether it's instrument residue, whether it's cement, whether it's, you know, what's causing this, check the occlusion, you know, all those factors need to be evaluated, but it's, it's always three millimeters or beyond. Now they've designated that in these new classifications. Got it. So, and then the, the, but the main thing we're going to talk about here at the greater New York is what are the new protocols for home care now? Mm -hmm. And what are we looking at for home care for each different type of implant restoration, just like each different type of natural teeth restoration. So they're both, you know, what is the latest and greatest on doing that? So we have some different tools to use now, which is really nice. We have the two-handed approach. We have the new hybrid mouth mate by Armor Dental, which retracts, and you're going to be able to see these, maybe these implants in the posterior that were real bulbous type crown and you wanted to be able to work around, but you really couldn't see what you were doing. So you're going to use that hybrid oval to retract and you're going to be able to work and you're going to be able to see and clean around the implant. You have the implant specific electric toothbrush tips by Oral-B that are made and Dr. Massad kind of developed that actually are just like three little bristles. So they actually fit underneath the implant bar. You have the, you have the tepi implant brushes that are specifically designed for implants to get underneath and real thin layer of brushes that can actually fit in and underneath an overdenture or a fixed arch implants. You have all those different things you can do. And and then I really like like the hybrid with the tepi flosser where you've got the the interdental brush where you can go in and you can actually scrub the biofilm and see what you're doing with that inner proximal brush right under and around the implants and scrub that biofilm. So there's some really good tips. Basically, you need to start out with brush by Staley. You have to uh, floss and to floss an implant, you have to do the mesial, distal, crisscross in front and actually shoe shine motion. And then you just take it off on the mesial and take it off on the distal. Don't pull it through, but take it up, up, and then You've gotten rid of all the biofilm because you've circum, you know, when you've done that crisscross, you've going all the way around. The implants are not held in by tissue. So since they're not held in by tissue, when you're doing that flossing and that crisscross, you're able to really get rid of that biofilm, especially if it's a nice thick woven floss, like a super floss or a tepi floss or something that you can thread in is extremely easy to use or use a water flosser with the different tips and they have a plaque seeker tip, which is nice where you can get in and, and really flush and scrub at the same time as you're using a water flasser and then use a rinse like a CPC rinse or a chlorine rinse that kills both the biofilm and gets rid of the VSCs, you know, the volatile sulfur compounds. So we need to rinse with something that does that. And we've really expanded our Stannis fluoride options now with the new like gum detoxify toothpaste, for example, that actually sits down in a periodontal pocket four millimeters deep for 12 hours. That's huge. Just working to to make sure that the biofilm isn't coming back for 12 hours. And if you're looking at it on an implant way, that does not have that quickly fluid floating around in there. So if you're using a gum detoxify type of toothpaste or any kind of stannous fluoride toothpaste that's got that stannous fluoride molecule that's going to prevent biofilm from forming and you don't have the fluid to wash it out. So that's why ideally a stannous fluoride is the way to go around, especially an implant or a periodontal disease patient, because you've got that kill the biofilm and make sure that the biofilm does not form for 12 hours till the next time they brush. 
blasts or rents. So that's kind of the new things in home care. I think it gives you a lot of options to tailor the care. When you're talking about stainless fluoride, it sometimes has a little bit of um, kind of some stigma behind it, right? Because in school, we're always taught that about the, the aesthetics, staining, staining, staining. Can you talk a little bit about maybe prevention or things that Crest has done to help prevent the staining? Yeah, they've, they've developed new formulas for that. And they've, you know, added more glycerin, you know, and then more glycerin type products. And it's very similar to the um, subgingival air polisher with the glycine and things that in there that's going to really work on the biofilm. So things are, the toothpaste are being developed and the mouth rinses now actually with the biofilm focus you know, to kill bacteria and prevent the biofilm from forming. So that's all kind of the focus, but they've taken out the products that were causing some of the staining and they've changed some of those cleaning areas to bind that more together so that you don't get that staining effect. So if you go with the, for instance, the pro health clean mint uh, version of the pro health toothpaste that has the new ingredients to prevent the staining you know, you've got the gum detoxify that doesn't have that staining component mm-hmm. in it, you know, so those, that is an important polyco, but you're always going to have some staining, stain retain on plaque if you don't eliminate all the biofilm. So if you don't eliminate all the biofilm, you know, you're, you're back to, you know, why do you have that? Right. So, you know, that's why you have to really make sure that you're scrubbing in between the teeth and you're, you're getting rid of that biofilm that's forming on that pedicle. Otherwise, just naturally, you're going to have different staining Sure. with anything. Your coffees and your... Food. Exactly. Red wine. Red yeah. Wines, <laughs> all of that. Green teas, all of that. Well, this has been very, very helpful. I think um, our audience is definitely going to learn a lot. Thank you so much for getting up such an ungodly hour. <laughs> After flying so, in. Flying in to, to meet with us here. Our listeners before loved what you presented on our podcast, um, and they're going to want to reach out again. What is the best contact information for you for them to reach out? Probably just going on wingrovedynamics.com, my website. There's links to contact me there Mm -hmm. or through my email, which is just SSWINRDH at gmail.com. So either way, I'd love to help them or answer questions with that or check out some of the different um, CE programs. I, I always do a full day with Liz Graham presents uh, six times a year where we get into all the latest and greatest. And it's an interactive seven hours where you're actually trying the products, you're trying the things, you're doing hands-on with models, you're doing home care with models. And so it's really a fun day. So that we do that six times a year across the country. So look for one of those as well. Nice. So don't forget about the instruments. Yeah. My instruments. From PDT, your Wingrove yes. titanium implant instrument. Yes. Yeah. Please check out that set. It's, it's um, 96% approval rating because of the fact that it's safe. It will not scratch and it will not leave residue behind. And it's designed, my late husband and I, who was a periodontist, designed the set. And it's to give you three instruments for wide base, narrow based and specialty so that you can have it all in one kit. Mm -hmm. Kind of your go-to kit is what we call it for pull it out. You're set to go for anything that you're faced with for your But I also think that the tips are designed for threads and they're designed for the tops of the screws. So they're, they're specific for every case. Yeah. They're specifically in implant specific, narrow base, wide based and the L5 mini and is actually the exact dimension that props into threads and screws and exposed, you know, threads on yeah. an implant. So that's, it makes it a lot faster for the hygienist to be able to get that debridement done. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Okay. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed this episode powered by Crest and Oral-B and be sure to check out the show notes and click the link to get your CE credits for this course. Also, you can check out dentalcare.com for more on-demand CE courses. And to listen to more great episodes from us, you can go to a tale of two hygienist.com. You are welcome to send us emails with feedbacks and questions, comments at a tale of two hygienist at gmail.com. And you can always find us on any of the social media like Facebook and Instagram. And we welcome all direct messages and sharing of all the episodes. Be sure to stay tuned for more bonus episodes powered each month 
by Crest Oral-B. Anything else, Andrew? I think that's it. Have a good week, everyone. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye.